The face has traditionally been regarded as the site of the authentic, of authenticity, of you know, the marks of someone's presence, unique subjectivity and truth about one's being. In the recent years, the face uh, has become affirmed even more as such, you know, through this um, desire to create presence for the face and, of course, uh, through uh, the selfies, but also a range of other pictures and uh, updates and forms of presence that people put on social media. Such presence, as um, Hito Steyrl uh, has put it, the terror of total design presumes and promises what she calls unmediated communication and unalienated experience. So it's some kind of form of promise of the truthful encounter between the individual and the others. And such encounters, um, of course, only become possible with a degree of openness that can be achieved through constant visual and emotional output on uh, social media. Such an authenticity uh, that is promised needs to be fed the stuff of life to ensure that it rests upon something real, authentic, both as key to the visual expressivity of emotions and active as documents, ensuring that pictures and posts are and of unique, real people. So all of these notions, authenticity, selfhood, presence, and truth are redefined and re-entangled today as they become you know, operative in these computational networks. Virtually no one would put an unedited um, snap of themselves online, of course, um, raw pictures don't exist there. They are pre-selected according to what they stand for, taste, conventions, purpose, and are processed by beautifying apps or image ed editing filters that are built into social media and cameras. So selfies offer a specific authenticity, a make-believe one, yet they're still pictures of someone's face, and therefore they're factually authentic in their technical and cultural fiction. Filters and apps, as well as knowledge and application of the photographic apparatus, you know, how you make a selfie, where you look, the lighting, have all become these infrastructures that every teenager is compelled to embrace. A certain visual presence is born, therefore, one that is compulsively authentic and yet quite distant from the true self. This distance is constructed technologically and is enacted ontologically. This selfhood and truth are linked by a distance in the sense in which the rearrangement of the factual and the fictional are these modes of operation of authenticity. So faces are captured by cameras, edited by apps, you know, uploaded, liked, and circulated in the networks. They operate in the like economy, accruing and losing capital. They're turned into data, aggregated, analyzed, and modeled, stored in databases, and become material for computer vision and facial recognition technologies, and then for targeting the owners, the owners their own owners of the faces for advertisement uh, or surveillance. So face on social media then becomes an authentic proof of presence of the self, a creative and fictional, though it's not false or fictitious, engagement with the requirements of the computational regime and also a site of algorithmic transformation. So this algorithmic transformation ensures that the face is compatible with the norms of beauty, which are open to the users, you know, you're changing the way you look, but also is formatted for data insights. And this is something that's close to the user. The image is prepared for uh, being harvested. So um, this is the second part of the same um, Sorry, I'll just do it like that. So this is a, a new um, startup from Odessa, which you know offers a much better beautification algorithm. And then um, this is a project from Igor Cvitkov, who photographs people on the web and then searches for their pictures in uh, Russian social media, and then it takes him one second to identify these people. So while um, the selfies are, you know, uh, created using this fiction of um, cultural um, representation. They're actually also connected to the fact that there are some people that can be identified and they're unique, real people. So the face on the network is not only two-faced, but is also continuous, generative, and future-oriented. 
It performs this authenticity of the presence in which a distance to the self is inscribed, but also it authenticates this authenticity that is promised by the computational mode of power by acting as an extension of the documentary tradition enforced by data analytics. So the face on social media is both a certain distanced presence to the self in which you invent the self to a certain way, but also is an index of truth, like an analytics-ready passport photograph. The multimodal truthfulness of the face offers vitality and anchors of verification to the data processing capital. Thus, the computational face can become the new fingerprint. Facial identification via documents such as biometric passport has doubled up here with um, automatic facial recognition, not obscuring the face, having to present your face in demonstrations, for instance, is a condition for a technique of, govern of governance where face acts within an apparatus of capture. The face, therefore, acts paradoxically as a site that embeds this distance uh, for the self and allows improvement, pl playful or painful disidentification or a possible construction of alternatives, as well as a site of capture and absolute identification with only one possible geometry of the face and only one available self. So the first um, option of creation of the self is clear in everyday social media presence, and the second in projects such as Zach Blas, uh, long-standing work with uh, facial recognition technologies and this particular part of facial weaponization suit which is um, um, following the biometric tracing of geometry of the face. Um, the requirement for presence, for the authentic, for putting yourself out there and always being online is a request for a certain affective truth. The emotional truth of feeling, the visual truth of the eyes and the gaze, usually the domain of literature and fine arts, is extended into computational networks. The factual truth of verification that the person who claims they are you is actually you through techniques of identification or computer vision is quite distinct from the emotional truth of presence and the visual truth of the face. And yet all these three ways of you know, truths interlink and are called, uh, are called upon together as they function in this new computational economy. Moreover, they ground and sustain each other. The factual truth of verification, the fact that, you know, you is you, the unique real person, promises the fictional truth of real life being put out there. Whereas the presence, the performance of fictional richness of emotional life is guaranteed by the factual presence of the real person. For example, it's only possible to cyber bully real people. The fictional construction of swearing and threat only works if an individual rather than an anonymized avatar gets hurt. You need someone to get hurt. And the ultimate fusion of invention and reality are cliff selfie deaths. Right, where life is lost in an attempt to create a unique photographic scene. So this is always kind of grounded back in the body, in the life itself, that the, the, the picture, the portrait, the, the selfie is created uh, on top of. The vitality of the eyes and the gaze, ensuring it is life itself looking back at you, is this force that data capital desperately needs. Moreover, it is this anchoring in life that data analytics requires to create forms of indexicality and objectivity that verifies the data modality itself. Algorithmic verification underwrites emotional truth, whereas emotional authenticity renders the factual truth of data analytics useful. These processes are core to the establishment of validity of the data-based mode of power as well as the economy sustained by such a modality. The currency of such an economy is authenticity, which is converted into indexical truths of facts to answer to the factual requirements of algorithmic objectivity, or exchange for uniqueness of presence of selfhood faces and emotions in the fictional universe of fulfilled life. 
Both kinds of these truths, of course, exert authority and are recruited to serve power. They perform truth and always constructed both the truth of data and the truth of subjectivity. So I have um, two more sections. Uh, one is on the idea of the return of identity in this computational data context. And another one on um, actual, actual biometrics and how the identity is constructed in, the, in, in terms of the biometrics. We are made to believe um, that every effort is made for the identity of the data subjects to be protected, right? What does identity mean in this context? It is partially derived from the scientific identity. The identity of material is determined by its unique composition. So if you take periodic tables by Mendeley, for instance, chemical uh, periodic tables, they will supply the identity of a chemical element as a number of protons in its nucleus and its electron configuration. So this idea of scientific idea of identity as having a unique composition is then extended into biology in the form of species identity. Uh, so you can, as a species, the performance of a species in an ecology then influences um, its balance. And further, it's extended into the world of people with the same biological concreteness, where identity presupposes a birth date, address, the assignment of name, gender, ethnicity, and so on. Activating people as units constructed in these terms, you know, borrows from the scientific arrangement of the world, grounding humans in the biology of aging, bodily certitudes, and predispositions to certain medical disorders. As well known, exactly the same inscription of age, name, gender, ethnicity, presses people in, into containers prepared for discipline, socio-political violence, or otherwise social cultural management and control. To ensure the cooperation of such biological entities, the notion of identity is further extrapolated whereupon identity is the process of being true to oneself, this looking for yourself. Identity is um, the idea of ownness, looking for something of one's deep own belonging to oneself. Such inward spiral for looking for oneself is explored in culture as authenticity. And here you have this idea of identity that is unique and authenticity that is true, that are like two parts of the same uh, process, a part of the same continuum. The dynamics of the relationship between the biological concreteness of the identity that rests on the bodily principle, on the body principle, the philosophical authentic identity of looking for oneself, and then identity and subjectivity that acts in societies of control. And all of these identities are not unlike what I just described before about the promise of the, you know, the fiction and the creation of the subjectivity through photograph, at the, grounded on this. Um, certitude of the body that is put out there and this is, that belongs to someone real and someone living. <coughs> Two things fall on from here. First, there is a computational update on the old dilemma of the site of the body. And um, there is uh, quite an interesting critique of this problem by Katerina Kolozova in a, in a book she wrote called uh, The Cut of the Real, where she talks about the body is the site of the certain authenticity of subjectivity, the site of, she, she, she talks about it as the site of the unthinkable real that we can never really um, uh, achieve. And this subject in its other forms exists in the realm of ideas. So she criticizes post-structural theory for creating this kind of paradox of um, the bodily certitude of the side of the body and totally ideational subjectivity, and they're always separated. Um, and she thinks it's a problem uh, that is a, a product of a tradition of dualistic thinking of matter versus idea. But the same very paradox is very successfully recruited and built into certain structures of data capitalism. In, 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 it maintains this very precise paradoxical form that interlinks life itself, singular and collective emotional experiences, artistic images, poetic utterances, photographic network apparatuses, and data infrastructures. So far from arguing 
uh, like Kolozova, for some kind of condition where a human can be, in the last instance, the real N1, our data condition points to the process of constant disaggregation, objectification, rearrangement, and repackaging of ideas and matter together in one container, capacities and relations, and things like that into data entities with a view for their usefulness and productivity. So identity as a property, a privilege to be, have, to be had, becomes a resource to be valued, managed and traded. In fact, it has to be carefully arranged, constructed among proposed or assumed points of intersection of this biologically concrete and the poetically painful, the economically imperative, and the symbolically desirable. It only works because of the intersections between these um, no, um, very distinct forms of articulation. Such points of intersection or interlinking include data-specific gestures of categorizing, comparing, storing, the forms of lists, models, profiles, and predictions, but also services and methods of technical authentication and authorization infrastructure, sets of legal practices and human technical cultures. So as causality in models, you know, when you talk about big data, it's always the talk about, people always talk about the same thing, that it's not anymore about causality, it's about correlation, and data is looking for correlation. And as causality gives way um, to analogies, continuous ma measurement, and the production of set of cases rather than causes, their validity is established by their usefulness. So while disassembling the regime of objectivity characteristic of science, data analytics needs a new mode of apprehending, capturing the world, establishing the real. The calculative data infrastructure needs to create its own version of mapping and generating the world and the system of validation uh, in which the points of connection, modes of referentiality between the world and the data can be established. A point of proof that you know, what data represents is linking to something that's out there. Some of these points uh, at which this capturing of the real world happens are of course around biometric data. Three minutes. <laughs> Biometric data is one of the sites that are assigned to the status of the real world that act as guarantors, some kind of linchpins on which other data abstractions can then be hung. Governance um, in terms of probability and prediction needs these linchpins of the real world and it produces them through assignation, like assigning persons as terrorists or assigning things as real. Um, biometrics, of course, promises to extract the truth from the body. And in that way, it acts, it uses the body as the, the guarantor of the, of the real world. So in biometrics, the process works as follows. First, during enrollment, the user generates a data sample, and multiple samples are obtained. When a predefined number of samples are collected, various features of the face are derived and classified to generate a template. And when you try to authenticate, you produce another sample, and then the sample is um, compared to the template that's stored in the system. So this is what happens when you go through a border control. And what's interesting about this process is that to make a useful um, authentication, to make identification possible, the system makes use of so-called attacker data, which is um, uh, samples of other people who might be using the system. And depending on the uniqueness of your facial geometry, your template, the features of your face can be weighed stronger or um, lighter, depending on the attack data. And what's really amazing in this is that the claim that these um, systems make, the claim of uniqueness, actually contradicts the way the system is built. The identity here is definitely not the sample and not the template either. It is not a certain kind of number or mathematical um, configuration or abstraction. It is a certain process that folds into itself a calculation of user profile in relation to other users or abstracted faces. So it's kind of process starting with the sample and ending with a match rate that is higher than the security threshold and that's expressed in percentages. 
So identity here is not, you know, some kind of old form of um, ontological authenticity that kind of resides within the person, but is a technical process that links biologically unique and computationally discrete. A face as one's own visual experience of themselves and facial features extracted, stored, and retrieved. And in the way they are prepared, what you have there is certain kind of computational editing that this, that these faces and these uh, features and this kind of geometries are already prepared for other kinds of abstractions and other forms of analysis to be performed on them. I'm finishing uh, now. So um, there's a lot of critique of biometrics, and there's a wonderful book called um, When Biometrics Fail, where um, biometrics is critiqued for coming back to the kind of old, um, as Haraway called it, corporeal fetishism, kind of belief into, on, uh, in, uh, in the body and the fact that um, apparently now in biometric research, people are, are looking for ways to inscribe race into the body and look for biological um, kind of proofs or features that would um, assign unmistakably a person's race or gender, uh, and this would be automatically recognizable. But the problem, of course, is not that. This is a very big problem. But the problem is that what is called soft biometrics, this is one of the first um, pictures used for biometric research, that all the other forms of analysis that analyze emotion and um, verify uh, the, the experience, you, looking at people's faces, and all the propositions about you know, the percentage of beauty that photographs can be evaluated upon, and all the other categories that at the moment data analytics and uh, visual computer vision is trying to work out in relation to the images. They are all of the order of soft biometrics. They are all some kind of layers of um, analyzing and making sense of this world, which are layered on top of this promise of you know, life itself being captured and put out there. And on the basis of this some kind of anchor, then other forms of abstraction, such as this, can uh, be inscribed, and they kind of hang upon them. So this is my uh, um, last examples. These are. Um, so uh, the software app that's developed by Affectiva company, which is a spin-off of um, Affective Computing, MIT group um, uh, that was uh, led by Rosalind Picard forever. And um, this software you know, promises to um, identify your unique emotions, and um, which is supposed to actually uh, turn out to be quite general and shared among the world's population. And then, uh, uh, analyze them according to, um, uh, to to conclude whether you liked the program or not. And these kinds of um, forms of um, leeching onto the world, or some kind of, you know, almost um, kind of yeah, anchoring in in, in the world, uh, are all of the order of soft biometrics, but they are. Um, layered upon this operationalization of the body in terms of the real world. And of course, um, this term, the life itself, uh, has been um, in the last 20 years studied quite widely in um, the politics of, um, of the body in, in, in uh, using the Foucauldian notion of biopolitics. But what's interesting in today's um, term is that it's not only life itself anymore, it's not the vitality principle, but it's the idea of the world itself uh, that, that is um, being captured and um, analyzed and then abstracted. So um, I'll just uh, say uh, one last anecdote. I was talking to a colleague of mine who um, was talking to Google Art, trying to get them to think about how, you know, when you look at all this um, paintings scanned in, in European museums, you can also think of the ways in which all the cultural outputs, all the films and uh, stories that be made about this art could be linked somehow to these um, pieces in Google Art. And that would be actually very much in line with how the internet was imagined and how mimics uh, was described, for instance, by Vannevar Bush. 
But um, Google told him that we don't have a technology at the moment to link this, so if you come up with one, just we would use it there, yeah, that's fine. So um, they, and, um, he concluded this anecdote saying that they are more interested now in Google Earth, uh, in uh, Google self-driving cars and in Google Earth, and in this kind of way it became really clear that symbolic production and cultural production and things that the internet kind of started from the idea that you can create this fantastic network of thinking um, is now giving way to the process of capturing the world and the earth itself, you know, the kind of the ocean um, and in, in this kind of in, in a desire to ground these data abstractions in something that is out there and is, uh, is somehow Im Im immovable and um, guarantees that this will be um, produced as a form of truth. That's fine. That's all. Thank you. I think that's the <laughs> effective slide. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>